The views expressed in this program do not necessarily reflect those of this station. Welcome to Insights into Northeast Michigan, a WBKB News public affairs program. Insights deals with the issues affecting those in the community, as well as Northeast Michigan and the state. And now, Insights into Northeast Michigan. Good morning and welcome to another edition of Insights. I'm joined by Dan Ludwig. He's the chair of the Alpena County Democratic Party and Linda Ayers, who is the vice chair of the Alpena County Democratic Party. And so you had your first meeting um, since election day uh, just a couple days ago. Um, yes. Tell me a little bit what happened at that meeting. Well, we discussed um, briefly uh, what we thought could have been improved on our part working up you know, to the election and what we were doing. Um, and then mostly after that, we were talking about future plans. What can we do for the next two years leading up to the uh, election of a new governor in the state? And of course, uh, there'll be state reps and um, US reps also. And I think we have one senator. Yes, Senator. US Stanley. senator up for election too. That, so, what, what we were talking about is how can we reach out to more people, expand the party in the county, and get more participants. And we were just tossing around ideas. And this was my first meeting as the chair because I was elected to it that night. So I am just starting out. And uh, I kind of came up with an idea of just like a three word kind of statement. Uh, one was, it was communication education and participation. What can we do as a party to reach those goals over the next two years and preferably starting soon and not you know, waiting till we get too close to the election so that we can grow the party in the county. And then uh, Linda and all the other people had ideas about you know, what we might do. Uh, Linda, of course, was the chair until this meeting and she wanted to step down and became the vice president. And I'm glad of that because she will be around to mentor me and, and help me. And Lin Linda, let me talk to you about, you were the former chair for six years. Yes. Um, tell me what someone in your role does. Well, I organized a lot of meet and greets for candidates coming into town um, and did a lot of uh, participating in the organization of an office so that we could have other candidates come in and work out of our office. We had uh, someone from the Hillary campaign uh, in our office. Also, uh, Lon Johnson was running for Congress and his representative was there and worked out of, out of our office and one for Robert Kennedy. And I just kind of oversaw all of that. And it's a lot of social things that you do and which I intend to continue to do also. And so a party chair is basically the organizer in this, you know, kind of a local or community or hyper local for even like national politics as well. Um, so tell me about like what events you had leading up to election day or like what kind of things specifically did you did you have? Well, we had um, some debate watching parties um, and uh, on the social end of it. And we also organized walks going out knocking on doors. Uh, we welcome different groups into the office and, and to go out walking for different candidates and phone calling, phone banks. Uh, we did a lot of uh, social things this, this time that we normally don't uh, do, but we had a pretty good size office and, and uh, we were able to really gather a lot of people and we had a lot of people show up at our meeting because of those things and ready to go to work. And Dan, so as the newly elected chair, uh, you touched on it a little bit before. You said you had came up with like a three word mantra or something like that. Yeah, kind of a mission statement with just three words, so. And so go in a little more detail about those three words and what they kind of mean to, you know, the party that you're representing. Well, um, one of the things that uh, I personally feel about the Democratic Party and as a whole um, national party is that often the communication between um, the leaders and all the constituents is, is not always great. Um, there is communication, of course, but sometimes it seems like they miss some very obvious things to me. 
that could have been bigger in the election, especially on the national scene. So my thought is, let's try as a local party to um, tell people what the issues are from our standpoint as much as possible and get out more in the community. Uh, that could mean different things. One idea we were thinking about is um, maybe going and town halls all around the county. The thought was that maybe we didn't put enough effort into outside of the Alpena area itself. Now, there were people out there and, and there were union people that came up to help us and even some state reps, but, nice. but we focused more, I think, at least our, you know, our local party on the Alpena city and township. Uh, I think we're gonna to have to get out into more of the rural areas and try to pull people in from out there as well because the city um, probably votes a little more democratic than the rural areas, so we have to probably put more time into that. And I think that's likely the case, you know, anywhere, any state you yeah. go to. Um, so what are some things you want to do to maybe attract, you know, more rural area voters? Um, because, you know, locally the Republicans kind of dominated the races as well. Yes, they did. Well, like I said, uh, getting out there in person. Uh, I was thinking that potentially we could make some videos and or even um, slideshows and try to get people like in a town hall meeting to explain what our positions are and as best we can and ask them what their concerns are. And, you know, there's an, I think in the rural areas, uh, there are a lot of, um, you know, township halls and things that we could go to. So that was one thought. Uh, potentially mailings, of course. Um, and I asked everyone to, to come up with some ideas, everyone that was at the meeting, you know, so that we'll discuss this more in detail as we go along. So being as I'm literally a, a day or two on the job, <laughs> it's going to take a little while to put the plan, but together, but it's to educate the people. First of all, get out there and reach out to them, try to educate them on issues, and then try to get them to participate in the process going forward. You know, volunteers, we had a lot of volunteers, but um, it's hard to get them too. You know, we could always use more. Um, so I'm hoping that we'll get more participation as we go up to the next election. And so are you already thinking about two years from now, it's another big election mm -hmm. statewide and nationally speaking, is that something you're already thinking about? Yes, um, it's very important from you know, our standpoint as Democrats that uh, we get a Democratic uh, governor in Lansing. So we'll obviously be focusing on that. I'm sure we'll have you know, help from the state party as well. And uh, potentially we'll get another office, um, I'm hoping. Um, yeah. And you know, do some of the same things we did, but try to, to expand the entire process to encompass the entire county. We, we did focus a bit on the city because one of the candidates really needed to win the city here, and he didn't, unfortunately. So um, next time around, we're gonna have to put more focus on the candidates for both state and US, and also the, the governor. All right, well, Dan and Linda, thanks so much for being here. We're unfortunately out of time. And stay tuned because there's more insights coming up after the break. Good morning and welcome back to Insights. I'm joined by ACC Professor of Political Science, Tim Kuhnlein. Tim, thanks for being here this morning. My pleasure. And so we're going to move a little bit more nationally speaking as involved with the election and we're going to talk about the Electoral College. Um, so there's a lot of debate about this because, you know, the popular vote candidate couldn't always win the actual election. So tell me a little bit how that works. Right, and as the total votes are coming in, the actual vote counts, we're realizing that the um, the difference, uh, the gap in the popular vote is actually shifting even more towards Clinton. I think she's somewhere around a two million dollar, or a two million dollar, two million vote difference in her favor. And just in Michigan, um, the count uh, is now official and it's more like 9,000 votes difference as opposed to the original 13 that was estimated. Um, so I think with the Electoral College, um, the point here is that it's not over yet, right? Um, it is, in terms of the methodology that we use, um, the, the election is done, but officially the election is not done. It's uh, not until December, actually the 19th, it's a Monday, that our electors actually go to our state capitol, um, all 16 of them, and they essentially cast their votes and for the state of Michigan. And until that's done, the, the, the vote for Michigan is not solidified. Um, and then uh, from there, uh, votes are sent 
by each state to the Senate at the U.S. Capitol, and uh, the U.S. Senate is responsible for aggregating these. And then on uh, January 6th, that's a Friday, um, all of the votes need to be submitted, and uh, they will be brought from the Senate to the U.S. House uh, Chambers, uh, House of Representatives, where a joint session of Congress will be assembled. Uh, the Vice President of the United States, serving as um, uh, uh, President of the Senate, will preside over the official counting of the electoral votes. And not until that um, final vote is cast is the, the presidential election finished. And so tell me about these electors, because they're kind of faceless people, I guess, in this whole thing. You don't really know who they are. Um, so who are these people? Well, they are real people, right? And it's just that's kind of the mystery of this whole thing. And it kind of shows how archaic the system really is. You know, this is a, uh, an institution that comes out of the 19th century, um, um, actually the 18th century, um, with the 1700s, uh, 1787 Constitution. And um, it, you know, it's really being used in a different way than it was originally intended. It was supposed to be a deliberative representative body for the purpose of electing a president. Um, and the, you know, our founders had a tremendous debate um, as to whether we should have popular election or an election by a representative institution. And they chose a representative institution. They intended it to be Hamilton and Madison and others viewed it as a deliberative body that would make the decision with the advisement of the people. But we have to remember our founders did not trust the masses. They did not believe in democracy. We're a republic, therefore we use representative institutions to make decisions like this. And um, so what we've done is allowed for that deliberation to be removed from the equation. And we've, because there's so much pressure to have this be more of a democracy, um, despite our founders' intentions um, and the, the role of this organization, the, the, the Electoral College, um, we put a lot of emphasis on translating the popular vote within each state into electors, and it turns into purely a mathematical formula. And therefore, it seems so faceless. But we do actually have people show up, um, 50, the, 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 in our case, the 16 electors for Michigan at the state capitol to actually cast the ballots. So these 16 electors say someone wins the popular vote, like Donald Trump wins the elector, electors from Michigan. Um, do they all vote with one person in mind, or can they split a decision well, in, in the state? Well, according to the Constitution, um, because this was supposed to be a deliberative body of those representatives, the elected electors, um, they should be able to shift their votes according to the Constitution, uh, because ultimately they are supposed to check the will of the people and make a sound decision for the right person so the wrong person doesn't get the power. They were terrified of this. They were terrified not only of democracy, but of executive power and the ability of the wrong person to have that power. Um, and so um, basically what we find is that um, that, that shift occurred um, and um, we've, we've translated this into uh, the, the plurality in the state gets their electors to go to the electoral um, decision in, in the capital. Those electors are determined by the parties, which is also interesting because that's nowhere in the Constitution. Um, and we've allowed this to, by state by state over the years, going back into the 1800s. By 1880s, this was pretty much solidified that the popular vote in that state would determine the electoral votes. Only half the states mandate that those votes, the electoral votes have to reflect the popular vote. Um, see, the problem, however, is that the majority of us, in many cases, voted for someone other than the person who got all the electors. Right. And, and so this is a real problem, I think, especially for those that want to push for a greater sense of democracy within our republic. Um, but even with the representative republic notion, we're, there's a gap here, a conceptual gap that I think is very difficult for modern people to, to, um, um, to reconcile. And you said there's kind of a disparity between states of how they actually operate with their electors that, you know, yeah. go place their votes. Half of the states um, mandate by law, and Michigan is one of them, that the electoral votes have to reflect the plurality vote. So in case of Trump, he got 47.7% of the vote. She got 473 or something like this. And so he gets all of Michigan's electors. The other half of the states do not mandate it, uh, that that translate. They can do whatever they want, actually. 
Um, they could have the electors make the decision um, based on the advisement of the popular vote. Um, they could split the vote proportionally. Um, two states actually do that. Um, but basically everybody's come into the fold to, with the exception of Maine and Nebraska, to, to say that um, however the plurality of the vote goes, the popular vote, there goes the um, electoral votes. And so here we are, although it's not mandated, it's just the critical mass, the inertia is in that direction. Could that be reversed? It's very possible because I think this is now five times, twice in this century, the 21st century, that this yeah. has happened. And we've ended up electing a minority figure that has turned out to be quite controversial, um, Bush and now Trump. And so, you know, even Trump himself didn't see the, the um, logic of the system until, of course, you're the winner. And, right. and this election will solidify as traditionally done. But I think there's going to be a lot of scrutiny about the, we don't have to change the Constitution to change the system. Um, because this could be done by a statewide um, initiative across the country, at least the critical mass to start changing the trajectory and have it be more uh, an accurate reflection of the people's will. Um, even though our founders, again, you know, they did, they created this representative body for efficiency. You know, without communication, how did you get the vote cast nationwide on a continental basis? Um, they were delivering votes by horseback. Um, and secondly, um, they did it because they didn't trust the popular vote. I mean, we're not a democracy. And we're going to talk, I think, a little bit more about representation um, and the problem that that poses for a society that believes it's a democracy. Um, it's a real conundrum. And I think a lot of people are very confused about a very complicated system. It's very fascinating stuff, but don't go anywhere. We're going to take a quick break, and there will be more insights right after. Welcome back to this edition of Insights. I'm joined by ACC Professor of Political Science, Tim Kuhnlein. Tim, thanks for being here. We're just talking a lot about the Electoral College. Now we're going to kind of shift towards the idea of democracy and how historically votes aren't really casted via democracy. It's more of a republic. Well, it's a big, um, I think, a conundrum in our system because a lot of people believe that we're uh, a democracy and that we have the the, we try to behave like a democracy where votes translate into decisions and those decisions are a reflection of the will of the majority, majorities rule, but of course they have to protect minorities and it's a little more complex than that. First of all, we're not a democracy or a republic and therefore we've, our founders set us up to rely on representative institutions. The Electoral College is the representative institution for electing president, much like the Congress, and interestingly, the, the num numbers that we use are similar for proportional representation, but Congress makes laws. And I think there's a big conceptual gap because um, we have this pretense that you know, our, our vote translates, and, and what we're finding is that in many cases, um, majorities and popular votes are not translating. Clearly, they have to go through elected representative bodies of government. But um, you know, we, we're seeing this conundrum with the Electoral College, the popular vote versus the electoral vote. And, um, and in that case, no one got a majority. Minorities are ruling. Majorities aren't ruling um, in, in some of these scenarios. And it's playing itself out. I mean, when you think about even our Congress, um, we, we have single member districts. Only one person can win. And um, they theoretically win with a majority. And in most cases, they do. You know, 50, 60%, 51% constitutes a majority. But many times we find in these equations a pluralities drive where the majority have actually voted for someone other than the person who wins the power. Uh, for example, you can imagine a 36, 47, 17 split with a third party candidate involved. And um, the 47 percenter wins but the majority of the people voted for someone else. So, you know, you know, if the person is truly representing everyone's interests, then this is probably not a problem. But as we know, there's a, a sense of disjuncture between the people's will and our representatives. And a lot of people feel like they're not being representative by who was elected to office. And you think this is kind of because you know, they didn't actually win the popular vote. Well, there's that equation, um, but then there's the part, because in many cases they are winning the popular vote, um, but the partisan, uh, partisanship factors into this. Who is that elected representative really paying attention to, first and foremost? Is it partisan interest within the district? Is it the district as a whole, the constituents? You know, if a Republican gets elected, are the Democrats somehow neglected? Um, you know, there's this kind of equation. 
Um, so, you know, it, this, this gap, and I think furthermore, people have this expectation that there's gonna be a direct translation between their will and the decisions of government. And we, we often forget that we get to vote on one thing, and that is who our representative is, and, um, or who the electors are for the electoral college. And, and then we're out of the equation. Yeah, it's not like we're voting for a bill that's being passed in the House. It's not like that's up right. for a popular vote. That that's, would be a democracy. Right. But that's not what we have in this country, uh, and nor was it the intent of our founders. Um, so I think there's just a conceptual um, gap here that translates into a, a frustrating reality that I don't think we always get our heads wrapped around um, when, we, when we think about our own government and the frustration we have with the, the actions of our elected representatives. And then when the Founding Fathers established a system like this, is it kind of based on fear of what a popular vote could... Oh, definitely. In fact, they didn't allow most of us to vote. I, until a few years ago, I wouldn't have been able to vote, even as an educated white male, because I didn't own property. And that was only later in the Republic that we started to allow a greater variety of people to vote other than um, basically wealthy landholders. You know, when you think about the, the nature of representation to most countries that are democratic republics like ours, they're much smaller, of course, um, the size of maybe one of our states, but they have about 250,000 constituents per representative. We have about 850,000 per representative. And we only allow one person to win in each district. And with the partisan nature of this, it, it, you know, we go back to the previous comments. Um, you know, if we were to bring ourselves, and Congress has the authority to increase the number of representatives to f provide a greater connection between each representative and their constituents, regardless of the partisan orientations and all, um, we would have to almost, um, you know, reach roughly 2,000 to be in proportion uh, right. with our current population. And a lot of these districts are pretty big area-wise. I know, like, even yeah. here, the first congressional district, it's a huge area-wise. That's right, one of the largest districts in the entire 435 seats. Um, and not only is it difficult to reach and be in touch with all 800 or so thousand people, but you've got to do it across this great landmass, and therefore people feel disconnected. Um, do I think it's realistic that Congress would reassess? You know, we've not always been at 435. We've gone through, I think, four iterations. I think this current number was established back in the late 20s, okay. 1929, something like that. And we haven't touched it since, but we've seen tremendous population growth right. and complexity of issues. Um, so, so this issue of representation, I think, is uh, really important to remind ourselves of um, so that we not accept necessarily these conceptual gaps and that feeling of disconnection from our own government, but at least we can begin to understand why these disconnects feel the way they feel, because they're real yeah. in many respects. And so what do you think people need to do if they do feel, you know, kind of a distance between them and their in the government? What do you think they can do, like, moving forward as well, we I, go I on? Well, I think the, the real challenge is if we had as much attention paid to our Congress and the actions of our congressmen and our state and local officials as we are paying um, to our presidential stuff these days, um, it would be a very different world, uh, perhaps a better world, one that's more responsive to the, the general populations living in these constituencies, these districts. But that's, again, we've allowed the psychology to shift. And um, part of that has been pushed upon us by um, human nature, inertia of political systems to concentrate power, um, it, it's easier to understand, although it's a, uh, not a realistic um, impression of the way things work or are intended to work, and everything gets off kilter. So I, I just think um, raising, gaining a greater degree of a consciousness and appreciation for the scope and complexity, the, the nature of the relationship between we as constituents and our elected representatives, not just our president. Our president really is not a representative, he's the executor of what our representatives um, do. That perhaps we would feel like there's, and we would get that, that a reflection of our will, um, even despite the flaws and the conceptual um, gap there. Well, this is fascinating stuff, Tim. Thanks you for being here. And that will do it for this edition of Insights. Be sure to join us back next week at the same time, same place for more. Insights into Northeast Michigan is produced by WBKB News. If you have any comments, suggestions, or topics you would like to see on a future show, please email WBKB News. This has been a production of Thunder Bay Broadcasting Corporation. All rights reserved.
The furniture and set design for this episode of Insights is provided by Young Appliance Art Van Furniture on US 23 South, Alpena.